again. Christy, what is that number again? <laughs> Page 333. My heavenly home is bright and fair. Do you feel like traveling? No, I don't think so. <laughs> I Yes, I feel like traveling. Oh, I feel like traveling. My heavenly home is bright and fair. Feel it. Has he been good to you? The Lord has been so good to me. I feel like traveling. Until that blessed home I see, I feel like. Yes, I feel like a rebel. Lord, I feel like a rebel. My heavenly home is bright and fair. I feel like a rebel. Sing this old song. We'll ask the ushers to come for this evening's tithes and offerings. I'm so glad. I'm all the flag. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by his blood, joined heirs with Jesus as we travel the sun, for I'm part of the family, the family, one more time.
These guys ain't very good, but they're cheap. <laughs> How many of you would love to be singing with your two boys? Pretty neat, huh? Well, I appreciate these fellas. They're, they're good men, good daddies, good uh, husbands, good providers, and they're good sons. And we thank God for them. Glad for um, just the opportunity to have them in our family. Yes, sir. -y. I value their, their advice. I really do. I'll ask them uh, often if I'm trying to figure something out, and I don't mind asking. Thank God for them. Are you happy? Where's you? Uh, hey, we got a bass man. Still one of Hoy's. Let's see if Hoy knows his own song. <laughs> Our C. Is that E flat, brother? E flat. Who said C? Our Savior was traveling one day into Galilee and Samaria. He was on his way, but he met ten of us who were lame with leprosy. We were crying out to Jesus, begging for. I looked upon my skin, it now was clean. Oh, and I could only thank the Jesus what he had done for me. That's when my journey with the other nine did in. Oh, you see, I had to go back to where I met that great physician. I down at his feet. Oh yeah. I said, Lord, there's something I must say to thee. I said, Lord, I just want to thank you for all the blessings you have for so brought my way and how your mercies to me are new each and every day how you saved my soul and kept your promises to me how you blessed me with health and strength and a Christian family just like that leopard child worshipped at your feet Lord, there's something else that I should say to Thee. Yes, sir. Oh, I said, Lord, I just want to thank You for all the blessings You have poured so bountifully on me. To me, Lord, You have been so good right, right by my side. Shed your blood for me. Your grace. 
Megan. Megan is in college down in Palm Beach, and, and she got homesick, and so had to go. Mom and Dad had to go see her. Amen. One of my favorite songs is uh, an early song that Hoy wrote, and it talks about um, uh, Onesimus. Is that you like that song? I have a number of folks that 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 was their favorite song, and it's a beautiful picture of Jesus paying the price for us. Thank God, our sin. He took our sin upon himself, and he paid for it, didn't he? Oh, bless God. Uh, we couldn't do it. We couldn't afford it. We didn't have anything to pay uh, pay with. And bless the Lord, he just said, put that, if he hath wronged thee or oweth thee out. Paul said, I will repay, put that on my account. Amen. The old apostle under house arrest began to write. A message on behalf of one who surely deserved to die. Onesimus had stolen from his Lord and run away. But Paul led him to Jesus and now had come the day that he would return to find Eman's house right the wrong he had done so with the letter in hand he was told by god's command it's time to go now my son with trembling fear the journey of onesimus began he knew the faith that he deserved for the wrong he had done to this man at last arrived and stood before the one whose mercy he pled. He fell to his knees and offered the letter, hoping that it would be read. Philemon took the letter and the writing he recognized. When opened up, this was the message. Found love I know that he's wrong and run away. I know he's unworthy to live. But oh, finally, on my behalf, I'm asking you to forgive. Receive him as myself. Amen. He's profitable now to me. He's met the blessed Savior. And he's not the man. was made in behalf of me. I know that he's sinful and often fails. I know he's unworthy to live. Listen, but oh, oh my Father, on my behalf, I'm asking you to forgive. Receive him into your house today, for he belongs now to me. His way was provided. Calvary, his death was all paid on one wonderful day when he knelt beneath the blood flowing down. So take all the wrong that he has done. Put that thing up one more time. I know that he's sinful and often fails. I know he's unworthy to live. What 
in Jesus' name. Oh, my Father, on my behalf, I'm asking you to forgive. Receive him into your house today, for he belongs now to me. His way was provided through the finished work at Calvary. all the wrong that he has done put that on my account you can take all the wrong that he has done well my Jesus said put that on my account Amen Alright, how about about if at least you <laughs> you know how many I'm working on 50 years being here 50 years you imagine how good I looked 50 years ago can you just <laughs> and I tell you it's been a good 50 good 49 anyhow so far and we're Jeffy was just a baby when we came here and um, he was six weeks old so anyhow it's been a good run I can tell you that the Lord's blessed we've had very feeble efforts. I'm telling you, we've failed in many, many ways. But you know, he'll bless the feeblest of efforts. Do you know that? Didn't know much. Raj, when Raj uh, retired, Raj said, well, brother, he told me, he said, I think I'm dying. But he said, it sure has been a good run. And so, but he didn't die, did he? He didn't. He's, he's in Calrays. He's at Calrays this week. So pray that he'll preach and preach with fire and brimstone that he'll pour it out. Well, everybody is talking about something you can hear as the crowd passes by some will talk about their wealth and their riches others talk about their trouble and strife i don't know how to talk to a rich man when compared i'm a beggar no doubt but if you're talking about that old time religion and I know what you're talking about If you're talking about that old time religion Then I know what you're talking about About the kind that would make you love your neighbor When old Satan will say turn around About the kind that will come for you in sorrow And deliver for you to make you shout And if you're talking about that When my poor soul was sinking in sin I like to talk about the time He has kept me Through the shadow, through the storm, through the rain I like to talk about the time Of his coming, as he said When I see his sweet face in the clouds If you're talking about that old time religion Then I know what you're talking about If you're talking about that old I'm religion, and I know what you're talking about. About the kind that will make you love your neighbor. When old Satan will say, turn him out. About the kind that will comfort you in sorrow. And never fail to make you shout. If you're talking about that old time religion, then I know what you're talking about. From a time he was a, a baby, he, he really liked me, and, and I was He compared. always tells this story. I was compared. Did I tell this already? No, you tell. It's okay. You can tell it again. You just always There tell might it. have been somebody here. <laughs> might be here tonight that weren't. But anyhow, 
me and Mickey Mouse were one and two. You know, so I think I was number one. Yeah, he loved me as much as Mickey Mouse. Yes, said, this is my buddy. <laughs> well, I, I will say this. I know. Um, I remember talking to my parents about that years ago about how I did. I always ran up to him after every service. I think the reason why is when you're when you're a kid, uh, you you are naturally drawn to people that smile a lot, aren't you? You are. And does anybody smile more than Ron does? And that's, that's one thing I love about Ron, is that the joy of the Lord emanates from him. And so, anyway, that's, that's why I always ran up to Ron. I, I still want to run up to him, but I, I'd hurt him. I, I'd do more harm than good, unfortunately. Uh, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Jonah chapter 4, the book of Jonah chapter 4. But uh, before I um, go into that, there's something I want to say that actually isn't really relevant for, with what I want to talk about tonight, but it's something I feel is really important. If you'll permit me, I want to take my phone out so I can uh, read something um, that I, I found uh, earlier this week. Uh, some of you may know, uh, earlier this week, a man that was considered a cultural icon by many uh, passed away. Uh, some of you may know who I'm talking about. Hugh Hefner, the founder, the creator of Playboy magazine. Back in 1992, he had an interview with the New York Times, and they asked him, and he would have been in his 60s by then, he died at the age of 91, um, they asked him, they said, what are you most proud of in your life? And this is what he said. He said, that I changed attitudes towards sex. He said this, I'm proud that I decontaminated the notion of premarital sex. That gives me great satisfaction. In fact, he wanted to be known as one of the ones responsible for the sexual revolution back in the 1960s. And then ever since Hugh Hefner had passed away earlier this week, celebrities and different people have paid tribute to him as if he was a, a great man. They, they, they quoted quotes that, that he had said in the past. But let me go ahead and, and, and tell you a little bit about uh, maybe part of his legacy that he left. Another article posted by CNN earlier this week says this, that the CDC... The Center for Disease and Control came out and said that there are that the, S, the sexually transmitted disease cases have hit an all-time high in America in 2016. Yeah. Over two million new cases, and right. that does not include some of the other. And we're talking about just chlamydia, gonorrhea, syphilis, and HIV because they have to track those. We're, there's a tons of other sexual transmitted diseases that they can't keep track of. Right. And the CDC has said there's 20 million overall cases of sexually transmitted diseases in this country in the past year. Yeah. In fact, according to uh, one one uh, one of the um, uh, the, the director said this, uh, uh, David Harvey, the executive director of the National Coalition of STD Directors said, STDs are out of control with enormous health implications for Americans. Right. Ladies and gentlemen, that is the legacy of Hugh Hefner. Amen. He is not a good, he was a sick, perverted, nasty old man. I, I'm not, I really, it makes me mad when people praise this man Amen. for perversion. Amen. That's what he pr promoted. And so, and this is something else I want to say too, is that any of the young people that are here tonight, please do not listen to people like Hugh Hefner. Pre sex before marriage is wrong. It is. However, we also, as adults, the older people, we also have to start thinking this. We can no longer today with our young people start saying, hey, premarital sex is wrong. Just don't do it. We need to start explaining to them why it is beneficial for them to save themselves Amen. for marriage. Amen. We have to tell them that. We can no longer say, here are the rules, follow them. Yes. You need to start explaining to them why it is beneficial for them to save themselves for marriage. Amen. And before I go any further, I like, won't even get to my actual sermon that I'm preaching tonight. I just wanted that, I felt like God laid that on my heart. Because of who Hugh Hefner is, he was not a good man. He, was, he, he promoted perversion, and I, I figured I would just share that before I uh, went on tonight. So sorry if hopefully you are okay with me doing that for a couple of minutes. But um, if you, if, Again, if you found Jonah chapter 4, please stand with me in the reverence of reading God's Word. Um, I want to bring you something a little bit different about a very familiar story of Jonah. Uh, we'll be reading the first three verses of Jonah chapter 4. It says this, but it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was very angry. And he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? Therefore I fled before into Tarshish, 
For I knew that thou art a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and repentest thee of the evil. Therefore now, O Lord, take, I beseech thee, my life from me. For it is better for me to die than to live. Before I go any further tonight, let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you so much for this day. Thank you uh, that we always have the opportunity to be able to come together to worship you, God, in this house. God, help us to never take that for granted. Just be with me, be with my lips and my tongue that I communicate exactly what you want me to communicate tonight, Lord, that we feel your spirit, that you walk up and down these aisles. We love you, Lord. We thank you for all that you've done for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. You can be seated. Uh, So we approach the part of the story of Jonah here, um, and he's a very unhappy man, as we can see. Uh, but the question is, is, how did he get to that point? Well, why is he so unhappy? Well, in order to answer that question, we have to look to the story kind of preceding Jonah chapter 4. And so even though this is a very familiar story that you've heard numerous times, I think it's worth revisiting tonight to, to set up what I want to talk about. Uh, we know that in the first chapter of, of Jonah, we see that God calls on Jonah to go to the city of Nineveh to preach to them. And of course, we know that Jonah doesn't respond well to that. Uh, To give you a little bit of perspective on what he did, uh, the the city of Nineveh was about 500 miles northeast of where Jonah was living. Instead of traveling 500 miles northeast, he decides to go a little bit west to the city of Joppa, hop on a a, a ship, and go to Tarshish, which is located in southeast Spain. So instead of traveling 500 miles northeast, he traveled over 2,500 miles the opposite direction. Now, the reason why he did that is that Back then, Tarshish was known as kind of the city uh, on the edge of the known world at the time. And so in Jonah's mind, when he was heading towards Tarshish, he was trying to, as what he thought, he was trying to get as far away from the city of Nineveh and try to get as far away from God as he could. And of course, we know that during this boat ride to Tarshish, God whips up a big storm and it scares the captain and the sailors of that ship. And of course, they go and they wake up Jonah, who was sleeping during the storm, and told him what was going on. And Jonah said, well, I'm running away from God. More than likely, the storm is because of me. And so they actually cast lots and they determined, okay, Jonah, you're right. So so what do we do? Well, they actually, Jonah's the one that suggested, throw me overboard. And they did. And now after they did that, the sailors and the captains actually offered a sacrifice to God for for two reasons. First, they thought maybe that would appease God and maybe the the, the storm would calm. But they also did it making sure that innocent blood wouldn't be on their hands because in their mind, they had just killed Jonah, throwing him overboard in the middle of a storm. Of course, we know that that's not what happened to Jonah. We get to the most famous part of the story. A big fish comes and swallows up Jonah. Uh, now, uh, the, the Bible in Jonah mentioned uh, the fish as a big fish. Jesus actually calls it a whale in the New Testament. But regardless of whatever the sea creature is, it's big enough to swallow a whole man. Yeah. Now, some people like to, uh, some doubters would like to say that maybe this is tr- obviously not a true story. How can there be a fish that could swallow a whole man? But today, scientists will confirm that sperm whales can swallow whole squids bigger than man. They can actually swallow a whole man. And meanwhile, there's a species of shark known as the Greenland shark, and they have been known to swallow polar bears and reindeers in whole. And others have reported that there was a tiger shark somewhere here in America that was found having a whole chicken coop inside of its stomach, and inside the chicken coop was chicken or remains of chickens. So I, I, that, that tiger shark must have been very hungry. Uh, but the point being is this, as Dr. Tony Evans said in one of his sermons about Jonah, is that Uh, The fact that Jonah was swallowed by a whale or a big fish, that's not the real miracle of this story. The real miracle of this story is what's going to happen in the city of Nineveh in chapter 3. But we get to chapter 2 where we find Jonah in the belly of the fish and and he's praying to God and it's a beautiful prayer of praise and thanksgiving to God. And of course, after uh, three days and three nights, the big fish vomits Jonah back onto land. I can only imagine if somebody was there fishing to see all of a sudden a man jumping out of the water and, and getting on land. That must have been quite a sight to see. But then we get to the beginning of chapter 3, and again, God calls on Jonah to go to the city of Nineveh. And after what Jonah had just went through, he decided, you know what, it's a good idea to probably follow what God is wanting me to do this time. And so he goes to the city of Nineveh, and by the way, according to Bible scholars, uh, Nineveh was a huge city. In fact, for about a 50-year 
period of, of history back then, Nineveh, Nineveh was the largest city and of the known world. And so he went around to the Ninevites preaching that they had 40 days to repent of their wicked ways or God would destroy them. And that's when the real miracle, the greatness happens. Maybe the greatest revival ever recorded in the Bible. It says this in Jonah chapter 3, verse 5. So the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them even to the least of them. In other words, basically everybody repented. And on top of that, the king of Nineveh came out with a proclamation demanding that the entire city repent. And so, again, some people may doubt this part of the story and say, how in the world could the entire city listen to Jonah? Now, well, there's two quick theories that they have of that, that Bible scholars have of maybe why they listen to Jonah, and they usually tie back to the idea that Jonah was swallowed by a big fish. Uh, one theory is that maybe in three days and three nights in, in a belly of a fish uh, with all the nasty gastric juices that would have probably been flowing through him or whatever, uh, that it might have changed his physical appearance. And that when he came back out, he looked so strange, so odd, that people couldn't help but listen to him. Uh, of course, the other theory is that, uh, um, that the word traveled fast, that there were some people that witnessed a man being spit out by a fish, and word traveled all the way to the city of Nineveh. Which, by the way, Nineveh, uh, in the original language, translated to the place of the fish. They were known for worshiping different types of, of sea gods, including Dagon, who was a type of fish god. And so when they realized, here comes the man that was spit out of a fish in a city where they revered sea creatures, more than likely they were willing to listen to him. But regardless, God used Jonah in a mighty way here. Uh, so here we are at the great point of this story where uh, somewhere between 120 to over 600,000 people repented of their sins. They delayed judgment for over 120 years. It was a great revival. In fact, Warren Wiersbe said this, if the, this book, the book of Jonah, if this book had ended at the last verse of chapter 3, history would have portrayed Jonah as the greatest of the prophets. Unfortunately, the book doesn't end at chapter 3. It goes to chapter 4. And chapter 4 reveals Jonah's true heart. Again, we see Jonah was displeased exceedingly and was very angry. Why would he react that way? Well, it's actually the same reason why he tried to escape from God's calling to begin with back in chapter 1. See, Jonah didn't want to give the Ninevites a chance to repent. He said in verse 2, he said, I fled before into Tarshish, for I knew that thou art a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and repentest thee of the evil. In other words, what Jonah was saying is, you know what, God? I knew that if these people listened to my message, and if they repented, that you would forgive them, and I don't like that. In fact, Jonah was so upset about the Ninevites' repentance, he said in verse 3, God, just take my life away. And so you have to say, well, well, why didn't Jonah want to give these people a second chance? Well, for one, I think, honestly, Jonah struggled with racist feelings, a feeling of a national superiority about him. See, uh, uh, Dr. John MacArthur, a great preacher out in, in California, said this. He said, Jonah was a living symptom of a national disgrace. In other words, uh, the Israelites back then were guilty of pride. A pride that they knew that since they were God's chosen people, they felt that they were better than everyone else. Amen. And not only did they think they were better than everyone else, they thought God shouldn't show favor to anybody else but us. And so Jonah would, grew up in that type of environment, so it probably would have been perfectly natural for him to be upset that God was giving these Ninevites a chance to repent. But see, I think Jonah being displeased at the, the repentance of the Ninevites, I think it goes beyond just these racial or national tensions. You see, we also have to remember that the Ninevites, who were part of the Assyrian Empire, so these Assyrians were truly an evil people. Uh, they, they, would, uh, they were known to be incredibly cruel to their uh, prisoners of war, their captives. Uh, they would take live victims, impale them on a pole, and then stick them out in the desert sun to literally roast to death. They beheaded thousands of people and would stack their skulls outside of the city gates. So violence was really a source of pride for them. And then they were even known for skinning people alive. And we also read in the book of Nahum, which takes place about 100 years or so after the story of Jonah, now we see that the Ninevites and the Assyrians were known to kill their babies and their little children. And so Jonah saw how these people lived, and he thought, 
God, how could you allow these people a second chance? They're not deserving of your grace. And when I see how Jonah reacts to this, I was actually reminded of an interaction I had had with a a friend of mine uh, not too long ago, a couple months ago. He's not a Christian, but he is curious and he he always asks questions. Uh, And so I talked to him about the grace and forgiveness of God. And I threw out an example. I said, in fact, God's grace and forgiveness is so great. It's a classic example. Even Pastor Will brought it up a couple months ago that even Adolf Hitler, as much as he did, if in the final moments of his life decided that he repented of all of that and he asked Jesus to save him, he would be in heaven today. And my friend looked at me and he said this, I I don't get that. And then he said this. He said, you know what, Ace, if I were God... And I was sitting on the throne, and I saw Hitler come to me, and I saw that he had accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior. I would still stop him and say, you know what? No, I don't care if you accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior. No, 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 no. This is where I draw the line. I'm not letting you in. Right. Right. And I kind of feel like that's what Jonah was saying to God. Yeah. He was saying, God, no, don't you see the evil that these people have done? Yeah. This is where you should draw the line. You shouldn't allow them a chance to repent. See, I mention all this because... Maybe some of us today, a lot of us probably don't have that deep-seated hatred that Jonah might have had for the Ninevites, but many of us have Ninevites in our lives. We have people or groups of people that if we're not careful, we assume are beyond the grace of God. Or, or, Or maybe if you're honest, you think to yourself, maybe you don't feel quite so bad that they're on their way to hell. And I know some of you may be thinking, Ace, no, that's not the case. I don't feel that way. But But think about it. Think about those who have spread evil, those who have spread hurt, those who have spread hatred over the years across this earth. And the first people I thought of were the ISIS terrorists. Remember how they beheaded Christians and they televised it? Let's just say that after after doing all sorts of evil, all the bad things that they have done to to Christians and to others, that they saw the errors of their ways at the end of their lives, and they asked for forgiveness, and they put their trust in Jesus, and they go to heaven. Be honest, how does that make you feel? Uh, the thing about this is, uh, do you realize maybe Osama bin Laden, what happens if in the last moments of his life he became a Christian, he's now in heaven? Or Adolf Hitler, Fidel Castro, or many others who are violent, evil people? Uh, what about those that live in open sexual sin, or those that, and they're not ashamed of it, or those that are atheists who openly mock our beliefs and think they're better than us because they don't believe in a God? Or, or, or maybe on a more personal note, what about maybe that person who deeply hurt you? Uh, What about that person who took advantage of you or took advantage of a loved one or a friend of yours? How does it make you feel that all of those people can still go to heaven if they repent? See, uh, today I think it's expected of us to hold grudges. I think it's accepted by the world standards to not always forgive and to just assume that some people are beyond God's grace. I was, uh, I'll, I'll admit, every once in a while I like to watch uh, Dateline on NBC where they tell real life mysteries, real life cases. And I, I saw one of, of where a woman unfortunately was murdered in Texas. And the first person they decided to share the, the bad news, the police, the first piece, the person they shared the bad news with was this, this woman's son. And they thought the son acted a little strange, but they really didn't think anything of it. But then they made him their number one suspect for one reason. They caught him telling other family and friends, he said, whoever killed my mother should be forgiven. As soon as he said those words, the detective said, we need to look for this guy. There's obviously something wrong with him. He became their number one suspect. Now, eventually they ruled him out. He he had an alibi. But the point being was that the detectives were basically saying, as what the world would say is, how can you forgive someone who did that to your mother? You, You can't do that. There must be something wrong with you. And you see, I think Jonah had faced that same type of thinking. See, by by going to the city of Nineveh and offering them a chance to repent would have been considered treasonous in the Israelites' eyes. It would be, and today it's contrary to the world's thinking to be happy that everyone can have a chance at redemption through Jesus Christ, no matter what they've done. No one, the fact of the matter is, no one is beyond God's forgiveness, though. Psalm 86, verse 5 confirms it by saying this, For thou, Lord, art good and ready to forgive and plenteous in mercy unto all. All them that call upon thee. See, God is ready to extend mercy and forgiveness, as Psalm 86 5 says, to all those who to all those who want it. No exceptions. And I think the Apostle Paul is a great example of how no one is beyond a chance to repent. 
uh, we have to remember that at one point in his life, he hated Christians. I mean, he had a source of pride being basically a bounty hunter hunting Christians. But then we know that he became one of the greatest missionaries of all time. Uh, but even Jonah himself, he probably should have learned the lesson of how no one is beyond God's forgiveness and grace. Think about it. Jonah disobeyed God's calling. Not only did he disobey, he just completely went the other direction. I mean, he even wanted to take his life. He, didn't want, he, he so badly wanted to get away from God's calling, he wanted his life to be taken away from him. And he was racist. He had a bad attitude. Uh, Dr. MacArthur uh, said that he said, if I were God, he said, I would have put Jonah right on top of the used prophet's heap and said, okay, you're done. But see, God didn't do that. He gave Jonah a second chance, a chance to repent. And see, that's exactly what God wanted to do for the Ninevites. But see, Jonah, he didn't see that similarity. He didn't see that similarity between himself and the Ninevites. And I think he didn't see it because he didn't have the proper perspective to see it. And so to be, uh, to be practical today, how do we, as Christians, resolve our feelings towards the Ninevites that are in our lives? Uh, where do we start in getting that proper perspective? Uh, well, to start off, we must remember that no matter what, God is the ultimate judge of all of us. Uh, when we look at how others are living today, as they please, they live in open sin and uh, you know, sexual sin, homosexuality. There's atheists, there's media that's openly mocking our beliefs. There's terrorists and others who are committing horrible atrocities, sex traffickers. All of these horrible people, when we see them, we think, it, uh, it gets us upset. We say, God, how could you let those people get away with it? Uh, Revelation chapter 6, verse 10, it was the verse that came to mind. It, it's where uh, the, the martyrs that are in heaven talk to God and they say, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? Yeah. And I can't help but think that even those of us that are here who aren't in heaven, we want God to judge people who are just as evil that we feel as the Ninevites. Yeah. Well, Paul has a message for us when we feel that way. Romans twelve nineteen. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. Uh, now, if it isn't our job then to judge people here that aren't living like they should, then what is our job? Actually, Paul tells us in the next verse, in Romans chapter 12, verse 20, he says, Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. He goes on to say in verse 21, Be not overcome of evil, but be overcome evil with good. Yeah. In other words, don't sink to the level of the Ninevites in your life, because that's not going to do any good. Instead, treat them the opposite way, the way Christ would. Pray for them. Be kind to them. Help them. Uh, but again, how can we even bring ourselves to do that if our attitude toward these people is just such dislike or maybe even hatred because of the evil that they've committed? Well, for one, I think we must learn to start looking at everything through the eyes of grace. Uh, Kyle Eidelman is a teaching pastor at the Southeast Christian Church in Louisville, Kentucky. It's one of the top five or seven largest congregations in the entire country. And he recently wrote a book called Grace is Greater. And one of his big points of his book is that uh, when he says this, is that when we look through the eyes of grace, our viewpoints on other people's faults and other people's sins begins to change. And he says that when we remember where God has brought us from, uh, what we've done before we, be, we were Christians and after we being, became Christians, maybe the, the shame and the guilt, we remember the shame and the guilt that we felt when we committed those sins, maybe it becomes a little bit easier for us to forgive those who have wronged us or to forgive those who have committed evil in this world. And then Kyle goes on to point out the, the parable of the unforgiving servant found in Matthew chapter 18. Some of you have heard this one. The parable starts out telling of how one servant owed the king of the land 10,000 talents. Uh, and now talents, they were the highest form of currency in the Roman Empire at the time. And therefore, since the, the Israel was under the Roman Empire, it would have been the highest form of currency in Israel. And when you do the math, uh, different people come up with different numbers, but 10,000 talents today would e uh, equal at least hundreds of millions of dollars, if not billions of dollars. So in other words, it's a huge debt, a debt that a poor servant could never repay. 
However, we know from this parable that the king actually forgave the debt completely and the servant didn't have to repay back a single cent. But then the same servant runs into another servant. And the second servant owed the first one 100 pence or 100 denarii. And now one denarius basically equaled one day's wages. So uh, this man owed the first servant 100 days wages, which would equal somewhere around $12,000 to some. But some Bible scholars say really it was only $20. But the point being is that this second debt is just a small fraction of the debt that the first servant owed the king. However, this doesn't stop that first servant from being angry and throwing the second servant into jail. And we know that once the king finds out about this, he, he said this to his first servant. He said this, Shouldest not thou have had, also had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? Yeah. He then forced his servant to be tortured until he could repay all of his debt, which would have never have happened. And the reason why Jesus told this parable was to tell us that all of us as Christians are like the first servant that owed that king an insurmountable debt. See, we owed a sin debt that we could never repay God. But Jesus paid that debt off by dying on the cross for our sins. First uh, Corinthians 6.20 says that we have been bought with a price. But the worst that anyone has ever done to you, or the worst sin that you've ever seen anyone ever commit on this earth, is just a fraction of what we owe to God. Amen. Therefore, our hard-heartedness towards the Ninevites in our lives should soften a little. Uh, but to even be more specific, uh, look at the story of Barabbas. Uh, see, we know that Barabbas, uh, Pontius Pilate, had gave the, the, Hebrew, the, the Jewish people a choice to either let go Jesus or Barabbas. Uh, we know that uh, Barabbas was actually set free, but we have to know who Barabbas is. He was a rebel. He was a thief. He was a murderer. He deserved to be crucified. Uh, so we talk about Christ dying for us, but think about it. He literally died in the place of a thief and a murderer. And so when you look at this through the eyes of grace, Jesus took Barabbas' place just as he took our place. Which, you know what that means? We're all in the same boat as a lying cheat and a murderer. See, with that in mind, maybe we should realize maybe we're not quite so different from those Ninevites in our lives. Uh, but before I wrap up, I, I want to point out one more thing, and it's this. God created the Ninevites just as he created you. Uh, Jonah had to learn this lesson himself the hard way in Jonah chapter 4, which, of course, ends the entire book. Uh, Jonah chapter 4, verse 5 says that Jonah built a shelter on the east side of, of the city of Nineveh to basically see what would happen. We know that he probably was sitting there hoping to see the destruction of the Ninevites before his eyes. Yeah. Uh, we see then in verse 6 that overnight, God planted a gourd or a, a big plant to grow and providing Jonah with some shade. And of course, that made Jonah very happy. However, the following night, God sent a worm to chew at the plant. And, and chewing here is translated to eating the plant. In other words, killing it. And so the next day, Jonah wakes up and he sees that he no longer has the shade that the plant provided him. And he was very upset. But then God ends the book of Jonah by asking a very tough question. In verse 10 of Jonah 4, he says this, Thou hast had pity on the gourd, for the which thou hast not labored, neither madest it grow, which came up in a night, and perished in a night. And should not I spare Nineveh, that great city, wherein are more than six score thousand persons that cannot discern between their right hand and their left hand, and also much cattle? In other words, God's telling Jonah, Jonah, you are upset over the death of something that you didn't create or invest any time in, and you only knew, you only knew about this plant for one day, you, and you were upset over the death of that. So why should I not be concerned over, the, over hundreds of thousands of souls in Nineveh that I created? You see, today, God feels the same way about the Ninevites in your life and mine. He created those people that are living in open sexual sin. Or he created the people that openly mock our faith. He created the atheists. He created the murderers, the terrorists, the sex traffickers. And he's still concerned about the souls of those people as he created them just as he created you and I. Now, as Jesus himself said in Luke 12, 7, But even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore, ye are of more value than many sparrows. 
And God values you so much, He knows how many hairs are on your head, but also, He knows how many hairs are on the head of the murderer on death row. He knows how many hairs are on the head of that terrorist who just committed another atrocity. And maybe that will help change our views on the Ninevites in our lives. I know that wasn't a fun message, but as I wrap up, I do want you to notice one last thing about the story of Jonah. It ends on a tough question. I know uh, Pastor Will had preached about this, how it drives him crazy, and it drives me crazy too, that we don't know what Jonah's response to those questions are. Uh, But I think there's a reason for that. Uh, Through all of the studies I've done with Bible scholars who have observed this story, they've all said this about the book of Jonah. See, the book of Jonah isn't about Jonah. It's not about a, a big fish. It's not about the evil Ninevites. It's, it's not about Jonah's preaching causing revival. No. The story of Jonah, the book of Jonah, is about God. It's about his mercy and the grace that extended from Jonah, who, who God used despite his disobedience, and then that grace was extended to the wicked people of Nineveh, giving them a chance to redeem themselves. And so tonight, uh, I just want to say this, is that if you're having a hard time with allowing God to judge the Ninevites in your lives, if you're having a hard time looking at them through the eyes of grace or looking at them as God's creation as we are, then maybe it's time to realize something about our lives. Our lives, just like the book of Jonah, it's not about us. Our lives are about God, and that's something to think about. As we bow our heads and close our eyes tonight, I know that probably wasn't a fun message, but I will say this, that for maybe those of you that are believers, and you think to yourself, you know, Ace, I I do have some Ninevites in my life. Uh, And those people, I'm unforgiving, I'm I'm hardened towards them. And, And tonight, you can change that. Just look at them through the eyes of grace. Remember that they're God's creation. And if you need any help with that, of course, the altars are always wide open for you to come to pray. But also, I never want to leave without giving the salvation plan to any of those that are unsaved. See, I talked about forgiving the Ninevites in our lives, but maybe you feel like you are a Ninevite. You haven't lived the way that you should. And you realize you've never accepted Jesus as your Savior. Well, I have good news. You haven't done too much. It isn't too late for you to get saved tonight. All you have to do is come forward. Ask Jesus to be the Lord of your life, and you will be saved. And someone will be here to pray with you. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you so much for all that you've done for us, God. Thank you for your grace and your mercy, Lord. Help us to extend that to the Ninevites in our lives, Lord. We love you, God. We thank you for all that you've done for us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand as Ron will lead us in the song. Page 57. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a Shake hands with some of our visitors here tonight.
Dave Ace a hand tonight. Great job. Yes, sir. Preaching. He did want me to make the announcement. We are still in need of, of two sponsors. We have two more college kids that need sponsors. So if you'd like to do that, see me, see Ace, and uh, we'd like to get that covered. So we